The following is a class given by His Holiness Jaya Pataka Swami Maharaj on May 9th, 1984. The class begins with a reading from the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 2, verse 66. One who is not connected with the Supreme in Krishna consciousness can have neither transcendental intelligence nor a steady mind, without which there is no possibility of peace. And how can there be any happiness without peace? Purport. Unless one is in Krishna consciousness, there is no possibility of peace. So it is confirmed in the fifth chapter, 529, that when one understands that Krishna is the only enjoyer of all the good results of sacrifice and penance, that he is the proprietor of all universal manifestations, and that he is the real friend of all living entities. Then only can one have real peace. Therefore, if one is not in Krishna consciousness, there cannot be a final goal for the mind. Disturbance is due to want of an ultimate goal. And when one is certain that Krishna is the enjoyer, proprietor, and friend of everyone and everything, then one can, with a steady mind, bring about peace. Therefore, one who is engaged without a relationship with Krishna is certainly always in distress and is without peace. However much he may make a show of peace, and spiritual advancement in life. Krishna consciousness is a self-manifested peaceful condition which can be achieved only in relationship with Krishna. Thus in the text 66, chapter 2 of the Srimad Bhagavad Gita, in the matter of the contents of the Gita summarized. So here, Krishna has first summarized that if somebody is satisfied in Krishna consciousness, that all of the threefold mysteries of material existence cease to exist. On the other hand, someone else who is not connected with the Supreme, even if they try to achieve some kind of spiritual consciousness, that it's not possible for them to have a steady mind to have a steady mind, one requires transcendental intelligence. And that's not possible without Krishna consciousness. So therefore, everything is in a very turbulent state, wherein it's not possible to have any peace. 
The description is given just as a drop of water is floating on top of a lotus leaf. If you've ever seen a picture of a drop of water on top of a lotus leaf, Floating on the water, it just spins around the top, always moving. It's very unsteady. It's much more aesthetic and smooth, but in its own way it's like if you have a very hot pan and you throw a drop of water and it's that's very violent. Lotus leaf is, of course, much more smooth and uh, passive in its own way. But that drop of water just spins on the top. It has no fixed place. Like that, unless the mind is anchored to the lotus seat of Krishna, unless it's fixed on Krishna's lotus seat in Krishna consciousness, then the mind will always be susceptible to be swept away by any one of the six senses, including the mind. So as a result, the mind cannot be steady. Therefore, one cannot be peaceful. In the next verses it also explains it's it's like a boat which is on the ocean and it's being swept away by the wind if a boat loses its rudder steering mechanism in the back then the whole boat just gets blown away So if our intelligence is not fixed in Krishna consciousness, then even if we try to remain in some aloof position, in a so-called transcendental position, the senses, the mind will always tend to rest somewhere. It's like a bird that can't fly forever, it's going to settle on some tree. So if we don't take shelter of Krishna's lotus uh, feet, the mind is going to take shelter of one of the senses. And then the senses will be agitating the mind, will be drawing the mind away in this way. One again gets drawn into material consciousness. Just like Vishwamitra, he was a born Akshatriya, but he wanted to become a Brahmana. At first the society wouldn't accept him, if he was a Kshatriya, how could he become a Brahman? But the Guru said it's possible. And following their advice, he did some tapasya. And he was finally recognized as a brahmana. But the Vishishta Rishi didn't accept him as an equal. He was proud that he was a brahmana. But Vishishta was himself much greater than an ordinary brahmana. He was a brahma rishi. Apparently, in the level of Brahmanhood, there's different stages of potency, from a Brahmana to a Rishi, to a Moharishi, finally a Brahmarishi, who can go up to the planet of Lord Brahma even. So, this is a very long story. There's off and on some
competition between Vishishta and Vishwamitra. So Vishwamitra is trying to gain recognition, trying to advance. One point, uh, he of course had such a uh, Seen with the demigod, one, uh, he would do tapasya and he'd gain his strength and he'd become so powerful. So one time there was a sudra and he prayed that he wanted to go to Swarga, he wanted to go to the heavenly planet. His name was Harishchandra, it's mentioned in the Bhagavatam. So then Vishishta, <coughs> Vishwamitra, he sent him by his mystic power up to Swarga Loka. But Indra said, this person is not qualified, he hasn't gone through the necessary pious activities, he doesn't have that type of karma, but he should come here, he sent him back. And then Vishwamitra had kept him up, so he was halfway between Swarga and the earth, between the Indra Loka, just hanging there. And Vishwamitra was uh, very angry that uh, Indra was refusing to accept the person he had sent. So then, since he couldn't, but Indra is also not uh, an unpowerful person. So then finally, Vishwamitra, he created an entire duplicate uh, heavenly planet. So, all right, you won't go in that, then I'll make my own. So with his mystic power, he created an entire heavenly planet and gave those to Harishchandra. So then that confused Indra that we have simultaneously it's like even in Switzerland I'm sure if you had two burns two Zurichs it would confuse everyone. The old Zurich would become envious of the new one. Something like that but probably even more confusing when you're talking about the whole planet. So Indra's whole position was becoming a little bit uh, dubious. So then to end the uh, confusion of having the whole duplicate planetary systems, he agreed, he made an agreement with uh, Vishwamitra, all right, we'll take Harishchandra into the Indra Loka, you please cancel out these duplicate planets. But in the meantime, Vishwamitra lost all of his, because by tapasya, he had gained so much power, he's completely expended. After all that, because it wasn't in a pure devotional service, so when you're doing devotional service, the more you give to Krishna, the Krishna again supplies more and more energy. But this Vishwamitra was doing not in devotional service. So his energy was depleted, he was finished. Again he had to do tapasya to build up his strength. So somewhere in one of those many, you see, episodes like this, as he's moving up in the levels of rishihood. So Indra, at one point, we have to take care of this uh, person. So he sent one of his uh, society girls, Maneka, to see if she could uh, distract him. And even though he was uh, so much absorbed in uh, meditation, when he heard her ankle bell, it broke through his meditation, his austerity. And as a result, Sakuntala was uh, born. So, said that even the mind is, uh, you see, very advanced with austerities and everything. If it's not fixed in uh, Krishna consciousness, it can always be drawn away. Sometimes if somebody is coming up too fast, the demigods get afraid that maybe this uh, person will want to take over our position. They may also obstruct. Or test. The same way there was an attempt to test uh, Haridash Thakur, but because he was completely fixed in Krishna consciousness, he couldn't be distracted. 
Even so much so that Maya Devi herself came to try to uh, distract Haridas Thakur. Even Lord Shiva has a difficult time in some ways. Anyway, of course, he's transcendental position. But it's difficult. Of course, nobody can resist except possibly Lord Shiva. The attractions of uh, Maya Devi. And, but uh, because of his complete absorption in Krishna consciousness, Haridas Thakur's uh, mind remained fixed. Didn't leave the lotus seat of Krishna, didn't go to any of the senses. So by being fixed in Krishna, not taking shelter of any senses, only Maya can attract through the senses. So when Haridas Thakur's total intelligence was fixed in Krishna's service, he wasn't at all taking shelter in any of the senses. So Maya Devi didn't have a hold. Rather, she also confided in him and she took initiation from him into chanting of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, 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 Hare Hare. Of course, we read in Bhagavatam that even great sages, you can't underestimate the power of of these great sages, they're able to, through their austerity, they're able to do such wonderful things that, uh, but sometimes because uh, they're not 10% fixed in serving Krishna, they have some separate motive. It may be a good motive or it may be to elevate themselves, but the intention is not to give Krishna satisfaction. So as a result, there's also some karma, there's some reactions and some instability there. So we find in Bhagavatam, even Vishistamuni and Vishnamitra, one time they got to cursing each other and they turned each other to ducks and birds or something like that. So they were such great sages that uh, they became angry and lost their equilibrium and thus they began cursing each other so here they became ducks and things so apparently before that Vishamitra one time he tried to curse Vishishta Muni but that curse was caught by Vishishta Muni and his dhamma couldn't affect because he said that you are not a Brahma Rishi you are a Maharishi you don't have the power over me so then Vishnamitra, he again did a tapai, he went to Lord Brahma or something and he said, how can I become a Brahma Rishi? He had to do intense apasyas and things. And finally Lord Brahma came and said, he said, I want to be a Brahma Rishi. So he gave him the blessing to become a Brahma Rishi. Then he came to Vishistha and said, now I'm also a Brahma Rishi. Yeah. Vishistha said, yes, congratulations. Now you are a Brahma Rishi. But don't think that that is the ultimate. There's something higher. Vishnu is something higher. Because all along he'd been thinking that that was the highest. If I can become a Brahma Rishi, then I will have made it. That's the topmost position. He says, what is higher? And I used to almost felt cheated. After so many years of tapasya and work, I mean, not years, but you see, yugas, by our calculation. And the Shistamuni said, no, the Narayana Parayana, the pure devotees of Krishna, they are far above even the Brahma Rishis. So, even a mental son of Brahma, like Durvasa Muni, he was defeated uh, by Ambarish Maharaj. So even Ambarish Maharaj, he was uh, attacked, but his mind was steady because he was fixed in Krishna consciousness. The Krishna consciousness is so sublime that even though one doesn't have this 
It's not necessarily that one has all this uh, superficial tapasya and things, but by complete dedication at the lotus feet of Krishna, by complete surrender and service, one becomes fixed. And one is under the complete shelter of Krishna. Krishna is Yogeshwara. He's the master of all mystic uh, powers. In our Sampradaya, you see, therefore we are not uh, concentrating on these mystic powers. Some yogis teach their disciples that they should meditate so they can levitate. And they come up a few inches and then bounce down and they think that this is a great achievement. But uh, this uh, Prabhupada gave the example that uh, once there was a disciple of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he had two, I believe, one or two German disciples. And he mentioned that uh, what inspired that he was, uh, that scholar was studying Sanskrit, and what inspired him about Krishna's uh, devotional service he said that uh, whatever the eightfold mystic uh, system is, they want to get uh, smaller than the smallest, greater than the great, bigger than the biggest, levity, all these things. It's already the modern scientists, they have the same objective through their microscopes, they're trying to get smaller. Through their telescopes and rockets, they want to go farther, get bigger. Through the jet planes, they're able to travel. The objectives are the same. So these mystic powers are also material. It's not that they are spiritual. Actually to develop Krishna consciousness, that is pure spiritual desire. So in our disciplic succession, mystic powers and such things are always considered on a, you see, subordinate level, not uh, very important. One example, one time in uh, Ramuna, Ramuna you know that uh, when Lord Rama was coming back from Sri Lanka after having rescued Sita in the Pushpa Viman they came over Orissa on their way to Ayodhya. And there was one very beautiful place. Sita said, let's stop there. There was all coconut trees and mangoes and very luscious and beautiful. So they just stopped there. And uh, in the discussion, they were having a discussion and Ram was telling about his future avatar, where he would appear as a cowherd boy. And uh, he playing flute. So Sita wanted to know what that avatar would look like. So they stopped at that place and there with his arrow. Lord Ram carved a deity of Krishna in a stone with an arrow from his uh, and to show Sita Devi. That deity is uh, being worshipped in Ramuna as Gopina. It is the Chir Kir Chir Kir Chur Gopina deity, the deity that stole the condensed milk for Madhavendra Puri. So the seva or the worship of that deity came to uh, the student of the six Goswamis and associate of Narottam Das Thakur, Shamananda Pandit. His chief disciple was uh, Rasika Ananda Das. And uh, one time some yogi, he apparently came to Ramuna and all the villagers 
the Pujaris there tell this story that uh, there's a samadhi there to the stick of the neem twig that Rasikananda brushed his teeth with. So why have they put that into a samadhi? So they explained that one day all the villagers came running to Rasikananda that come, come immediately, there's a yogi who is flying to the village on a stick and a branch. Rasikananda was brushing early in the morning, he's brushing his... You know, in India they take a twig. It's called neem. The Lord Chaitanya appeared under neem. So the same neem, they take a small section of the branch and you chew on it. And then it, because it's a soft branch, it becomes like a brush. In fact, even the modern medical dental surgery, they say the best motion for brushing the teeth is the vibrationary circular motion. So when you brush on it with a twig, the only motion you can do is this vibrationary circular motion. But anyway, that's another point. Everything Vedic has got its perfections. These, uh, anyway, so he was brushing with a twig, just in case. You might, it might seem very primitive, but uh, the neem branch itself contains all kinds of juices which are very good for the, not only for the teeth and the gums and everything, but they're good overall for the airs in the body. Story about a man who walked to some place and on the way he kept using this babul, another type of tree they used to brush the teeth. By the time he reached that place, he got leprosy. Because although that's very good for your teeth, it's very bad for the airs in the body. Then he was told on the way back, you just brush your teeth with neem. And by the time he reached back home, he was cured of the leprosy because neem is very good for the airs in the body. Anyway, so he was brushing his teeth with a twig, not to get off the point. Not very interested. And they kept pressing him, going, no, no, you should come and see this yogi. He is flying. Flying! Just, you know, villagers, they're very sick. And our Padayatra in the the Suhotra Maharaj was saying, I think that the most simple people in the entire world are these villagers. Very simple people. They're just very innocent, very simple. So when they see someone flying, you see, even when they see somebody walking, thousands of them come. <laughs> to see somebody flying. So they kept, oh no, you should see this. He's flying. And Rasik and Amri said, this is not important. And he took his uh, twig from his mouth and put it under his leg. And he flew around the ashram four or five times. This is not important. Simply chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Landed back down and finished brushing his teeth. So they took that twig and they put it in the other manjivan. So our acharyas, they don't. Express these things because Krishna is the master of all mystic powers. So if you're carrying out Krishna's work, well, he can, his will will be done. So, because these things also, they can become very distracting for the mind. So the devotees, they avoid. So in our devotional service, of course, previously, to engage in this type of devotional service was especially organized by the brahmanas and by the twice-born people, the kshatriyas and the vaishyas, you see, type of people who are born outside of Vedic culture normally would be very far from this kind of spiritual concept of life. But Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is so kind that he has given this uh, special uh, benediction that anybody, they can take to Krishna consciousness. I mean, they can get this mercy no matter what their previous 
qualification or disqualification may be. And where normally it might be difficult to fix the mind on Krishna, but by this process of chanting, Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Adwaita Gadadhar Sri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare It is uh, an engaging in the Sankirtan movement. It's uh, quite easy to fix the mind on Krishna. Still, some effort has to be made on our part. We should try and depend on Krishna and he'll also give us the intelligence. Teshang shatada jiktanam bhajatang preti purvakam dadami buddhi yogam tang yanu mamu vayanti te. And of course, we should follow the intelligence given by the bona fide spiritual master. Here just like, <coughs> see... Vishnu Pad, Hari Swami, giving always such good intelligence for printing and distributing Srila Prabhupada's transcendental literatures, involving everyone in this spiritual sacrifice, so pleasing to the Lord. Like this we follow the higher intelligence Avoiding that type of intelligence pulled by the material senses. Our material senses may always be pulling us. How to enjoy the sense of touch, the taste, the hearing, the seeing, the mind, the smelling. But rather we engage how to do everything for Krishna's pleasure. This way the mind becomes fixed, becomes linked with uh, Krishna's lotus feet. And therefore it doesn't become tossed about by these currents of uh, material desire. So the Prabhupada explained that as soon as we begin to desire something material, Immediately, we become in anxiety. So, to avoid that anxiety, we should always desire to serve Krishna. This is essential. This is explained in this verse. For not connected with the Supreme, and we can't have a steady mind, can't have transcendental intelligence, no possibility of peace. If there's no peace, how can there be any happiness? So, this is a very important point. Tomorrow, we're observing Vamana. Dwadasi fast on Ekadasi and I think you know about how Lord Chaitanya observed Ekadasi when he was two years old this Ekadasi was always very dear to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in fact when he was just two years old hardly speaking One day, so normally Lord Chaitanya, he would cry, and then when the ladies would go, Hari Bol, Hari Bol! Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare! Then he'd stop crying. But this day, even no matter what they did, he wouldn't stop. So after about 10, 15, 20, maybe half hour, hour of chanting different, he wasn't for two years, right from that time he was just, he would always stop crying, but this time he wasn't stopping crying. So they called in Jagannath Mishra that please, your son is not stopping crying. It was a new phenomenon. So then Jagannath Mishra 
जी बट दो चैतन्य वाई आर एस प्रयास मैम वाई यू क्राइम यू इज नॉट क्राइम इज द जगदीश पांडित एंड हिरोई पंडित I having a big feast today offered to the Lord for a kadasi. I want to have that prasad. <laughs> Jagannath Mishra himself he didn't know about any he got no invitation because the uh And how does two year old son know what a kadasi you know it takes a few years to know about a kadasi <laughs> they don't you don't have children do a kadasi normally so they were or they don't even if they do they don't they just eat what you give them anyway so he, they were astonished that uh, i mean of course jagadish pandit was uh, uh, jagannath uh, mishra's uh, close friend But he lived about two, three kilometers away on the other side of the Chilangi Saraswati River. They hadn't informed of any. It was a kadasi. But how did Lord Chaitanya, I mean little Nimai, how did he know about a kadasi? They couldn't figure it out. If they hadn't taught him about a kadasi at that point, and whether there was really a festival that day or if they didn't know anything, but he wasn't stopping crying. Sorry, I went on. to the house of Jagadish Pandit. So there, this was a once a year, maybe on the same day, I'm not sure, one of the days, because for the Lord, <coughs> He uh, doesn't have to observe the Kharasis for the Kharasis. We also, the Lord can take the things. So they were offering uh, some special offering for the Lord uh and the cars came but they would be taking the next day and then uh, they went there and that uh, sure there they had prepared like the 108 preparations all the little parts and in front of it just the, in front of the deity and then Jagannath was so astonished how did he know you no know, i didn't even know how did he get the information so then he told jagadish pandit that uh He said, Vishnu Mbar, Nimai, he had this thing happen. And then even Jagadish Pandit, he said that, uh, I didn't tell anybody because nobody can take the feast. It's a kind of thing, just for the Lord. I tell everybody next day. <laughs> so, <clears throat> he took it that uh, this, uh, nobody knew anything, but he knew, therefore, somehow the Lord is acting through him, some kind of an Aresh or something. So he should take the Lord. He can have the offering in paper for Shara. And uh, they are very happy to give all the offerings to little Mumai. Lord Chaitanya, he partook of that for Shara. And both he and the Jagadish Pandit and Hidai Pandit, they were very overwhelmed. You see, in this way, Lord Chaitanya, even from two years old, he was actually encouraging everyone should follow the Sikharas. He requested his mother when he went to Jagannath Puri that he, one of the few things he requested he follow a Kharasi. We heard at one time the Pandas in Puri, they wanted to force Lord Chaitanya to take the grain on a Kharasi. He said, Prashad, you have to take it. He said that Prashad they can take tomorrow. He said, no, no, you have to take it now. So like there's some, so apparently, of course this is one of those things that the devotees in Puri say. Lord Chaitanya bowed down to offer his respect to the prashad. He stayed in that position so that the kairasi was over, then he got up and took the shot. <laughs> he was able to outsmart the Brahmana. The special purpose of a kairasi is that we should... Uh, increase our glorification of Govinda, that we uh, don't take grains on the Kadasi, 
that's especially to help us to remember the lotus feet of Krishna. And that's why we also try to increase our chanting. Or, of course, if we're doing important service, then we go on. But that day is especially for making a little special effort to be a little more conscious about Krishna. One time somebody asked Srila Prabhupada that, maybe it was me, I heard it. <laughs> about some of these special days like Ekadasi and Kartik month that you get, you know, so many bonuses you get. A thousand times the hundred times or something like that, the effort doing Kartik months by doing things as if you were doing another time. Similarly, Ekadasi you get bonus points. So Srila Prabhupada, in fact there's stories about how even a husband and wife, they were having a big argument over something and yelling and throwing things, just you know, full out fight. Even in the Vedic times, I guess sometimes these things did happen. And as a result, they were just so absorbed in fighting and whatever, arguing with each other over some point, that they fight it through the whole day and through they fought the whole day and through the whole night. And their fight, their, their argument didn't cease until the next day. They didn't eat, they didn't stop for anything. So because that day they had observed, Ekadasi happened that that particular day was Ekadasi. They didn't eat the entire day. Both of them got liberated, got uh, what, heavenly planets or something like that, just for because they were just fasting, even though they were fighting with each other. So somehow each one of those Ekadasis, it says, has some name. It always says uh, some moksha da ekadasi. Something happened on that ekadasi, like that, that ekadasi where husband and wife they just they were having an argument and then they forgot to eat that day because they were so angry at each other that they got uh, elevated because it happened that that day was ekadasi. What to speak if somebody is doing it to please Krishna? What was there was some more? Oh, so then Prabhupada wrote me that. So he wrote me that these uh, these special days, so they're like in the shops, in the stores, sometimes they have special clearance sale, discount sale. So this is to attract new customers. He says the regular customers, they're already coming. That the regular customers, they don't, whether they have, the certain clientele is there for the shop. So, but to attract the new customers on some holiday, they offer some discounts. So Srila Prabhupada said that you're already, those who are fully engaged in Krishna consciousness, they're already getting the, you see, Unlimited mercy. But for those who are in the material consciousness, so just to attract them by Sawai, then this day you get some special bonus to get the new customers. So these facilities are offered. <laughs> but for the devotees, they're anyway 24 hours, 365 days a year engaged, so that's not a problem. They're regular customers. <laughs> Just like you're supposed to fast on Ekadasi, you have to have a feast on Dwarasi. So in Krishna consciousness, fasting and feasting. Whenever there's a fast, it's always followed by a feast. Or for the devotee, fasting or feasting, it's the same. It's all for Krishna's pleasure. <laughs>